Hello everyone. So the intention of this video is to give a case study of what we have done in our own home in terms of installing a heat pump and how it's worked for us. I will start by giving a quick overview of the project before then going into the system design in a bit more detail. I think it's a useful example because in many ways our house is fairly representative of an average house in the UK today in terms of the amount of heat it needs and it's also a terraced house which is fairly common. So I hope at least parts of what I've done are transferable. The house is a mid-terraced house, it's solid wall stone construction. The floor area is 77 meters square and having done an energy assessment, the predicted heat demand is 9,700 kilowatt hours over a year. So it's pretty much the same as the UK average. When we bought the house a couple of years ago, it had a multi-fuel back boiler that didn't really work we ended up using a lot of electric heaters in the first winter. Having already had experience with heat pumps from a previous project and my work, I knew I could get it to work even in a house with such poor building fabric. And although we intend to improve the building fabric as well, we, need to, we needed to go ahead and get the heat pump installed before the next winter so that we could at least get some heat into the house. So this is the heat pump. It's a Mitsubishi Ikudan 5 kilowatt unit. Uh, it's an air source heat pump. It's mounted on the back wall of the house with pipes going straight through into the bathroom. The heat pump is connected to a central heating radiator system in the house and we have a special heat pump hot water cylinder. Here's a picture of the living room radiators. Uh, you can just see them there behind the sofas. Uh, these are standard double panel convector radiators from Screwfix. They're sized to give uh, good performance at low flow temperatures, which I'll come back to shortly. Then in the bathroom we have a hot water cylinder with a special large area heat pump coil. Um, these, this provides ample hot water for showers, baths, etc. We've had the system in now for just over a year and a half and we have had two winters and this last winter uh, with a little addition to the family uh, so we needed to keep it extra warm. The system has worked really well providing plenty of heat making it much more enjoyable to live in the house. So I'm now going to go into a bit more um, technical detail. Uh, I'm going to talk about the performance of the system and then go over the design of the system in more detail. So a heat pump essentially uses electricity to move heat from the outside of your house to the inside. The reason that a heat pump is better than a direct electric heater is that for every unit of electricity you put into it, you typically get two to four units of heat into your house. This means a heat pump uses around a third of the energy of a direct electric system. The, rate, the ratio between the heat output and the electricity input is called the coefficient of performance or COP. I was keen to monitor the performance of our system to see what kind of COP we were getting. I should say that energy monitoring is what I do for a living because I've always been keen to understand how well these things work. I made sure to install good quality metering on the system, both for electricity input and heat output. I then used our open energy monitor system to read from these meters so I could collect detailed data over time. I'm pleased to say that we managed to achieve an average COP of 3.92 for, for both space and water heating over the first year, which is put pretty good really, considering that the average in the Energy Saving Trust heat pump trials in 2013 was about 2.5 for air source heat pumps. That, that means that based on the average grid carbon intensity in 2019, the heat pump delivered heat with 70% less CO2 than a gas boiler, or in terms of cost, based on 15 pence per kilowatt hour electric, each unit of heat costs 3.8 pence per kilowatt hour, which is about the same cost as gas once you, once you take into account the standing charge that you would have to pay if you were paying gas separately from electricity. While the performance we have achieved from the heat pump is high, which is great, we've also achieved this with what are often thought of as non-ideal conditions, in particular poor building fabric and radiators rather than underfloor heating. So I'm now going to go into a bit more detail on the system design. I had a lot of help uh, with installation and the design from John Cantor, who I have worked with over the years on heat pump monitoring. John has a lifetime of experience with heat pumps. 
um, and has written a great introductory book on heat pumps that's worth reading called Heat Pumps for the Home. I'll, I'll include a link to this uh, to the book at the end of uh, at the end of the video. If you're interested in doing the calculation for a heat pump system yourself, a good place to start is with the MCS heat pump calculator. This includes a room by room heat loss calculator that you can fill out by measuring out the, the dimensions of each room in your house and entering suitable U values. The results give you a maximum heat demand that your house will need at the coldest time of the year. It also tells you how much heat each room in your house needs so that you can match up the radiators or the underfloor heating. An installer following the MCS standard will need to do these calculations for you, so you could always look at the results and discuss them with your installer. I've included uh, links there to the um, heat pump calculator if you're interested in exploring those and, and some associated uh, useful material to go with that. My calculation for the heat pump or for the heat demand of our house during the coldest hours of the year suggested we would need 5.5 kilowatts of heat. And that, that might reduce to around 4.9 kilowatts if you take into account the small amounts of heat given off by um, sources of heat, small sources of heat such as lighting, appliances and cooking in the house, or body heat and also solar gains. Reflecting on our intention to improve building fabric and that we had a backup wood stove if, we, if it did get very cold, I decided to go with the smallest available Mitsubishi Ikudan heat pump a 5 kilowatt model rather than a larger model with plenty of spare capacity. From previous experience with heat pumps, I was aware that the smaller heat pump had a lower minimum heat output, which can help provide better efficiency during warmer times of the year. This choice has worked well for us. We haven't had any issue with not being able to deliver enough heat, but I don't really feel like I have enough experience with a wide variety of systems to give general advice on that particular point. It's worth noting that the 5 kilowatt heat pump has ample capacity for the heat load at average January temperatures. So, at, so around five, if it's five, the average January temperature is around five degrees outside, and um, the heat load should be around 3.2 to 3.8 kilowatts. Um, so that's you know well below the 5 kilowatt capacity of the heat pump. The next step when designing a heat heat pump system is to make sure that you have enough radiators or underfloor heating to emit that heat into your house at the water temperature that makes a heat pump work efficiently. At this point it's probably useful to go over a couple of key concepts that are useful to understand when trying to get a heat pump and radiator system to work well. The performance of a heat pump is largely dictated by the Carnot COP equation possible to estimate the COP that you would expect your heat pump to be providing by just knowing the outside temperature and the temperature of the warm water coming out of the heat pump. If you're interested in the maths in a bit more detail, you might be interested in a page I put together here on these equations. Um, if you have a look at that link uh, that there. Looking at the heat pump data sheet, the COP when the out outside temperature is 2 degrees Celsius and the flow temperature is 35 degrees Celsius, should be around 3.5. If the flow temperature is 60, this drops to a COP of around 2. Boiler-based heating systems usually work at high flow temperatures, around 60 to 70 degrees, and that's a lot higher than the flow temperature that you want to design your heat pump system to achieve. If you look on, say, screw fix for a radiator, it will usually state, state its heat output rating in watts. As an example, this standard double panel convector radiator has a standard heat output of 2000, uh, 2000 watts. And this is at a difference in temperature between the radiator and the room of 50 degrees, which means if your room is at 20 degrees Celsius and the radiator, um, the radiator would need to be at 70 degrees Celsius. We can see in this table what happens if we reduce the temperature of the water going to the radiator down to the ideal temperature for our heat pump. So at around 30 to 35 degrees Celsius, the radiator will emit between eight and five times less heat than uh, at 70 degrees Celsius. And this means that you end up needing quite a bit more radiator area than you would need at you know, gas boiler temperatures. 
though it's not quite five, five to eight times more, as you also typically run the heat pump for longer in the day than you would uh, a gas boiler. You can of course use underfloor and you can also get uh, fan assisted radiators that provide a lot of a lot more heat output at low temperatures. Installing underfloor heating as a retrofit is obviously quite a large job and the fan assisted radiators are a lot more expensive. So uh, although I would have liked to have been able to design our radiator system to provide 5 kilowatts at a flow temperature of 30 degrees, so I couldn't I couldn't quite make that work without going for a much more expen for, for much more expensive fan assisted radiators. I ended up going ahead with a radio system that would provide 5 kilowatts at a water temperature of just over 40 degrees Celsius. According to the data sheet, this would provide a COP of just under 3 during the coldest hours of the year, which is okay. To, um, it, it was reassuring to hear in the Carbon Co-op webinar with Paul Kenny of Tipperary Energy that they also designed for flow temperatures of 40 to 45 degrees Celsius. Uh, at minus three degrees outside. Though it's worth saying that if you can design for lower flow temperatures at minus three, then that's you know even better. At the average outside temperature in January, the radiators would need to run at a water temperature of 35 degrees, which should provide a COP of around four from the heat pump, which is, you know, that's great. The drawing here on the left shows the position of the radiators that we have in, we have in our house, alongside the heat pump there at the back and the hot water cylinder in the bathroom cupboard. For domestic hot water, we have a hot water cylinder with a special heat pump coil. The coil has a larger surface area than a standard coil and so works at lower temperatures, making the system more efficient. Discussing with John Cantor, I decided to go for a non-thermostatic shower mixer. My understanding is that a thermostatic mixers uh, introduce a slight trickle of cold water that mixes with the hot at all times, and so you end up needing to keep the water in the cylinder hotter than you would otherwise need it to be. By using a basic mixer, I could just heat the cylinder to the right temperature for the shower without mixing any cold. I've been able to achieve pretty high COP this, the, this way, but I'm not sure if it's really going a bit over the top. It, it means we have to be careful when we do a Legionella protection cycle to mix in a little cold water to get the right temperature. It can be common now to use thermal stores rather than conventional cylinders to minimize or eliminate Legionella risk. Discussing the pros and cons with John, he had had better experience with conventional cylinders with heat pump coils, and so I decided to take that route for this project. Um, I would be interested to learn more about thermal stores and compare the results from both. So here's the final system diagram showing what we have installed in our house and an outline of the material costs in the system. I haven't included labour here as I did a fair bit of the work myself alongside getting help from John <coughs> and, another <coughs> and another friend with plumbing experience. You can see that system in many ways is quite simple. There are relatively few components. Probably a couple, couple of things to note is that it's good to get a low, a low energy central heating pump as the pump runs for much longer than a boiler system. The Wilo Pico is a good model. The main circuit is all 22 millimeters copper with individual radiators branching out with 15 millimeters. And that reduces the work that the low energy pump needs to do. In this last section, I will just go over a couple more examples of the monitoring results and talk a little on control as I, as I go through these. Earlier in the year, I wrote a blog post assessing the performance of the heat pump over the first year. In, ad in addition to the high COP I mentioned before, we also use much less energy in total than the energy assessment suggested we should use. The total amount of electricity consumed was about was 1,276 kilowatt hours, which cost us about 192 pa 191 pounds for the whole year. The largest reason for our reduced use of heat was that we were generally happy with lower to indoor temperatures in that first year than a standard. The outside temperature was also warmer. 
I could not fully account for the difference in my analysis. It may be that we have better U values or less air leakage or perhaps more heat from our neighbours. Um, it was interesting to see that we actually got the electricity consumption 5% uh, lower than the average household electricity consumption um, for space heating in, in zero carbon Britain. So I was, yeah, I was quite happy with what we managed to do there. So this is an example of the indoor temperature in our living room last January. We achieved an average temperature of almost 19 degrees Celsius. During the evening, that was closer to 20 degrees. We felt that this was plenty warm enough and had just had a baby, so we were more than conscious than ever that about needing a warm house. We were able to maintain this temperature while running the heat pump at 32% of its maximum capacity. The average flow temperature when the heat pump was running was 31.5 degrees Celsius, and that gave a COP of 4. The heat pump was running at a low level for 80% of the time. The small dips in temperature were partly switching to, to the hot water heat up cycle and sometimes leaving the system off for a couple of hours. Had we wanted more heat, we could have increased the flow temperature of the heat pump as there was plenty of capacity spare. It's worth saying that because the heat is, is really constant, we were leaving the heat pump on for 80% of the time. Um, in addition to having a warm air temperature, we also had, you know, it meant that the, the walls were all, had also heated up to those temperatures or, 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 to a, or to a higher temperature than they would be uh, if we had heated it up um, in a short time with a gas boiler. So that also contributes to a, a feeling of greater comfort in the house. We currently take a fairly simple approach to controlling the heat pump. We, ge we generally just set a fixed flow temperature for space heating, typically 30 to 32 degrees Celsius, and then turn it on and off manually as needed. We can do this remotely and set a timer if needed so that we can have it come on a good number of hours before we get home. I don't use the built-in weather compensation as the house has a lot of thermal mass and so it doesn't work as well. I basically end up doing the weather compensation manually and always run the lowest flow temperature I can. We usually turn the heat pump on well in advance of when we need the heat so that we can heat the house up with a low flow temperature. During the coldest time of, times of the year, if you are out say for work during the day, it can make sense to just leave the heat pump on all day. It can actually be more efficient this way than having it boost a lot of heat into the house over shorter time periods as it would have to run at a higher and so less efficient temperature to do this. It's also better from a grid perspective as you're not drawing so much electricity from the grid at peak times. On that note, here's a graph of the electricity consumption of the heat pump throughout the month of January compared to the cost of the variable price Octopus Agile tariff. It's amazing how low the average price can be, even with those high evening peak rates. It's possible to get all the way down to two pence per kilowatt hour in some months. I'm still waiting for Octopus to sort my smart meter, but I'm looking forward to getting on this tariff once it's working. That's it. Thank you for listening. Um, I'll leave. So here's a. A couple of links that um, may be of interest, the links to the, the MCS heat pump calculator, the blog post on the performance over the first year, and a link to uh, John Cantor's website with um, where you can find his book. Um, thank you. Thank you for watching.